Hello, 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 friends, fellow humans. Welcome to the Topography Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Hoden. Today I'm speaking with Chuck Thompson. He has written several books, six in total, I believe. I've read two of them. The first I read maybe 10, 15 years ago, it's called Smile When You're Lying. And it's a travel memoir, really good, very funny. Um, and his most recent book, which is the main focus of today's talk is called The Status Revolution. Um, how the, the improbable story of how the lowbrow became the highbrow. And it's a, it's a great book. It's talking about the changing nature of status in today's age um, and what it means for humanity. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, Chuck is a talented guy. He's done a lot of stuff through his life. Um, he, aside from his books, he also wrote and executive produced a three-part music documentary that's called Sometimes When We Touch, The Rain, Ruin, and Resurrection of Soft Rock. And it's a three-part music, it's streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Um, what else? Let's get into some of his um, credentials here. Um, so he, what? I mentioned that he's the editor of the nonprofit environmental news website, Columbia Insight. Um, previously, he was executive producer of CNN Travel and editorial director of CNNGo.com. He was also an editor of Wicked Tribune, deputy editor of Men's Journal, features editor for Maxim, and editor in chief of Travelocity. Um, his writing has appeared all over the place, way too many publications that are on the list here. Um, but it's a lot and he's I've enjoyed everything that he's that I've read of his so far. Um, he is also the recipient of a Peabody Award for his contribution to the coverage of the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, he's the recipient of the Lowell Thomas Travel Journalism Gold Award and the 2021 Society of Pro Professional Journalists Award for Environmental Reporting. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the talk. I hope to talk to him again in a future podcast and i hope you enjoy it too thank you um and if you do enjoy it please subscribe to us and review us on any of the places where you find us thank you you know it's a lot different than the last couple of books i've done which have been about politics in the south or travel straight up travel kind of books so you know i tend to not be the kind of writer that um sits on the same subject matter all the time so i i, I find a lot of new writers I think with every book that I've done, and I, I shed a few from from other writers who are sort of expecting either another political book or another straight travel book or something like that. Um, but yeah, overall, it's been great. I mean, I was really happy. I, you know, the publisher thought that the, the hardback sales went well enough to go into paperback, so that was that's a good sign. And um, yeah, I'm still getting a lot of interest in the book. I think it's a topic that you know. It's, it's ubiquitous. It's on everybody's mind in, in a lot of forms. And it's just this weird kind of vague notion that people know about, but it's it's actually really kind of hard to define. And so I think that's made it of interest to a, a really wide spectrum of people. Yeah, yeah. So what is the status revolution? Well, the status revolution is occurring on a few levels. One is, is a, kind of an academic scientific understanding of what um, status is, how uh, the human brain processes status, um, you know, how we you know, use it in our daily lives. It's, it's really changing. There's a sea change in, uh, in really for, for the entire history of how science and, and religion has sort of, um, and, and society has viewed status as this kind of reprobate emotion, this sort of um, almost sinful, um, you know, impulse that we have. Um, but with, with um, in neuroscience and, and, and fMRI and other kind of technologies are really changing how we view um, what NB, uh, what status is. It's also happening on a cultural level. I mean, with the democratization and the sort of um, um, you know, attacks on the assaults on the pillars of privilege in not just the United States, but all around the world, really. Um, you know, there, there's people that are, are staking their own claim to, to status and privilege and prestige that doesn't have to do with um, ways that traditionally um, those concepts have been thought of. What were the sinful aspects of it traditionally? Well, <clears throat> you know, literally going back to Greek and Roman philosophers saw um, this separation 
of classes of wealth as problematic in society, particularly when people with great status, which is often associated with great wealth, though, and we can get into this later, it's really it's this kind of a sidebar. But I think one of the biggest mistakes people make when thinking about status is that thinking that status just necessarily means you're rich or that status is always tied to money, that more money gives you more status. That's not really true in the way that status operates, but we can get that later if you like. But 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 there, there is a connection, of course, between wealth and status. And when the wealthy classes, you know, in, in Greece were flaunting, for example, we're having uh, really elaborate funerals and other sort of public displays of wealth, it was creating a real problem in their ideas about, you know, that we now know as democracy and what, what they were trying to set up as a society, an equitable society. Um, and so they, they, there were laws passed, you know, in, in ancient Greece and ancient Rome to sort of try to um, curtail uh, the, the flaunting of status publicly. Um, once we get into you know, the Christian church, Catholic church, and, and a, a sort of religious, um, in Western society anyway, the sort of powerful institutions of the church growing up, um, you know, they literally saw status. If you look at the seven deadly sins, almost all of them are tied to some idea of, of status and wealth and greed and overindulgence and these kinds of things. And, um, you know, for, for the Christian church, the Catholic church, and churches that, you know, grew up around it, um, the, this sort of idea of, of, of status was looked at as this sinful impulse that, you know, God might not want. So the, the, the church really very cannily took ideas of status and kind of transferred them into, you know, these sort of public public works projects, building these great cathedrals and giving your, your money and status to the church, right, and, and, and being part of that organization. So, so they really looked at that as this kind of... Um, you know, sinful impulse. And then we get into the sort of consumer societies um, of the, you know, 19th and 20th centuries. And we get um, books by these guys like Thorsten Veblen, Vance Packard, which, you know, the status seekers and the leisure class, which were very critical of, um, you know, the upper classes who sought to display their status via automobiles or fur coats or, you know, uh, vacations or huge houses with massive lawns. And most of the um, most of the social critiques of status, dating back to the late 1800s, when we see you know sort of mass consumerism coming um, into play, are extremely critical of people. Um, you know, as it's it's this kind of thing that shows your vanity or your weakness and your supplication to to marketing and advertising schemes, right? Um, when we think of people, I mean, think of yourself, you've probably done it. I've done it. We've all done it over our lives. It's like, oh, you know, that, that, are, are we allowed to curse on this um, podcast or? Oh, we, yeah. Okay. I was going to say, oh, yeah. you know, like, like this asshole in his Lamborghini or his BMW or front, right? It, it's, we sort of look at people who are attempting to um, elevate their status or flaunt their status as, you know, shitty people basically, right? I mean, that's the, that's generally how we viewed status. And so again, the status revolution is kind of seeking to overturn all that, those ideas. I mean, those are those are ideas that are ingrained in our society going back thousands and thousands and thousands of years, right? That, that yeah. the, um, you know, open, willful seeking of status or displaying or flaunting of status is a bad thing. In fact- And it sounds like it's, it's, it's evolved through the years too. It's definitely right. evolved. It's definitely evolved yeah. by, you know, yeah, I, I think but, so. The way that people have understood status is definitely, um, well. but you know, there's another, there's all sorts of layers of status. It's pretty interesting. I mean, think of, I talked about status not being necessarily tied to money. I mean, think about mm -hmm. a, a high school in middle America, the, the star quarterback of the football team might have a lot of status within that school, right? Or the the head cheerleader, or maybe the student body president, or the you know president of the debate club, if that's the kind of school you're in, that person can attain a lot of status within that community. That has nothing to do with with money or wealth, right? That's just one mm -hmm. example of that. I mean, the Pope uh, has enormous status and prestige within not just the Catholic Church, but all over the world. Really, the Pope officially it, that has no salary, has no money, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Now he's he is and other religious leaders. By the way, it's not just the Catholic Church; it's most um, religious institutions sort of elevate you know the leaders of that church and and surround them with a lot of pomp and often luxury and status. And officially, they may be <laughs> impoverished and penniless, 
yet they have a, a managed to attain a, a huge degree of status. Yes. Yeah. So it sounds like from Rome moving forward, it kind of originally status became an issue because it was destabilizing, or at least the display of it, this display of extreme wealth was kind of destabilizing to the culture. And then it sounds like it kind of shifts into the more like almost being a good person idea in the church, like being kind of like a upstanding citizen. It goes away from the material world a little bit to like, are you virtuous? Something Absolutely. More like that. I think and you're yeah, more of but I think that part of yes, you're right. Although I would I would assume that 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 shift into you know, pressuring someone to be a virtuous person through an abdication of self status is is probably part of keeping that community stable as well, right? It's sort of a strategy because you're yeah. right. It is it is a destabilizing influence. Although I mean, the American Revolution is probably the greatest example in the history of the world of I mean, that was a status revolution, right? The the colonists. We're sick and tired of not having the same. Now you could say you can say this is where where, where status gets pretty gauzy. You can say they don't have the you know the, the rights of representation without taxation and all that. But really, it was the status thing. The, the people of um, the United the American colonies did not have the same status of the people of England, right? And they wanted mm -hmm. that. They wanted self determination in in at least a limited form, and they didn't have it. And, you know, there's a quote in the book, I can't, I should find it now, but some philosopher basically talks all about how the American Revolution was a status revolution, really. I mean, World War II, Germany, um, you know, everybody, any historian will tell you that the, the seeds of World War II were planted after World War I when the Treaty of Versailles and the, and the agreements that were made after World War I really kept Germany in a position of inferiority to, uh, yep. adjacent to its neighbors in France and Belgium and England and, you know, all over Western Europe. And this was, this was the emotion into which Hitler tapped to, to generate this mass um, support of his movement, that Germany was not going to be held out. It, its status would not be lesser than its neighbors. Um, that, yeah. that was where that impulse came from entirely. So, th so there's a tension kind of with, um, status being destabilizing and then i is there any stabilizing aspect of status in society does it serve so. a positive yeah so there's a tension kind of between the destructive and stabilizing sides of of this perception yeah you've got it i mean every single every single you know animal community society is based upon a kind of pecking order or a status order in which people understand their place in that society either above or below those are a little bit of you know social constructs but whether you're where you where you sit on that social hierarchy gives you a sense of of permanence and stability and an identity as well um i yeah. remember i talked to a guy who i quoted in the book um <clears throat> who was a, a veteran a u.s army veteran had served in iraq and and um had dealt with his share of troubles with PTSD and, and opioid addictions and things like that. And he now um, works with an organization that, that helps veterans reacclimate to, you know, civilian society. One of the things he told me I found very interesting, he says, you would be really surprised how disorienting it is for a lot of soldiers to reenter the civilian world. He goes, when you're in a military setting, you can walk into a room and just by looking at everybody's uniform, you know, the, the, stripes on their shoulder or with the, the signals on the cap, <clears throat> you know who everybody is in that room. You know who they're, you know, if there's five, 10 or a hundred people in that room, you know all of where, how they rank. And, and, and in that sense, how you need to address them, who you need to defer to, who you can be more casual with, this and that sort of thing. He goes, when you're stripped of that, and if you've been in the military for a long time and you walk into a room, a civilian room, it's really disorienting. He goes, it's, it's not to say oh, wow. you can't handle it. It's like, you know, we're, we're people, we're smart people. But at the same time, it's like, I don't know how to navigate this room all of a sudden, right? If I've been in the military 10, 15, 20 years, and I just, just snap to it, all of a sudden you have no visual cues, right? So wow, in that sense, that is, yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah, I hadn't either. That's why I included it in the book. I was like, dang. Yeah, what a... What an interesting detail. I, yeah. But you're, but you're quite right about the the both the, the destabilizing factor of, of status, but also the stabilizing factor too, right? That kind of keeps our yeah, societies yeah. coherent. 
I've and it's so when people, funny. It's when people are breaking out of those roles that a lot of conflict erupts and a lot of misunderstanding erupts. And that is part of what I'm calling the status revolution. Now, there's a lot of yes. people that are, are really trying to redefine what status means. And that yeah. makes a lot of other people very uncomfortable. I, I want to jump into some of the specifics about how that's occurring. There's one idea that I want to share now, like kind of related to this balance. Um, I've recently, I've been thinking kind of about the nature of evil in, in society and just like the idea of pure evil. And when you see, like, particularly now we see all this stuff going on, it just sounds like all factions of our society are kind of under attack from the institutions that are meant to be protecting them. It feels like in, in a yes. major way. And I, I don't know what it is, but the funny thing I've noticed about it all is that like, if you imagine pure evil, it's almost like a void of any kind of self or like personhood. And it's just sort of like straight destruction. You know, if you imagine like, like I wanted, I, I hated humans and I wanted to harm humanity in the best way possible. And I could just press a button and they're all gone. Like to me, that's evil. You know, that's pure, pure evil where there's no sense of remorse or anything. It's just purely a destructive force to the point where it destroys itself even because there's nothing left to destroy. And, and these dramas that humanity kind of plays out where evil sort of enacted through manipulation and persuasion, trying to convince populations that it's a, for the better good when it's actually not, you know, there's all this theater involved in it. And at a certain level, it makes me think that it's kind of proof that overall humanity, the evil good scale tips towards the good. And that even evil is kind of like enacted through the self will of a person who still craves to be respected or included in the group, somehow not ostracized. You know, there's all these bonds between humanity that evil is unwilling to sever in a certain way. And I'm wondering if status isn't part of that mechanism that even in, in its dark side, it has a self-protective measure because the people enacting it are not willing to go so far to like be totally destructive. Well, you're maybe talking about, there was, God dang it. There's this book I'm trying to conjure. I used to, I bought about five copies in the nineties and I sent it to people it just about this topic. If you'll allow me, I might at some point pause this and run and find it because I know it's on a bookshelf in my house. Oh, absolutely. You're, yeah. You're kind of talking about maybe impulses toward the individual versus what is good for the group, right? Isn't that yes. really and This book that I'm talking about, I'll find it. You want to pause real quick? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can okay. hang tight. Okay. I'm going to, I think yeah. if I can find this book, it's either right here or here. Yeah, this is it. I knew it. Great. I'm so I'm so Perfect. glad. You need to read this book. It's called okay. Dark Nature: A Natural History of Evil by Lyle Watson. This is an amazing. Here it is. I'm holding it up for you. Oh, I'm going to read that. I'm going to read this that. Book is like this book fantastic. I read it several times in the '90s. I used to send it to people when we get into these kind of discussions. Now, I don't know if Lyle Watson is around still or not, but I'm probably going to misremember two thirds of this book, which I haven't read for probably 20, 25 years at this point. But um, my sense is that, or his sense, Watson's sense was that um, there's no such thing as evil, right? The organisms act on their own behalf. That's just what organisms do. They act to survive in the best way that they know how. Now, what, when you get evil is when an organism is acting in a way that is detrimental to another organism or a group or something, right? Do um, <clears throat> you know the movie um, uh, Last of the Mohicans, the 1990, the Michael Mann, Last of the Mohicans with Daniel Day-Lewis and Madeline I, Stone? It's a remake. I, of, I, know, I know it, I just don't know specific. I don't know well enough to call up. It's a great movie. But, it's a Michael Mann movie, and it's a remake of, you know, the classic Last of the Mohicans. And there's one of the most evil villains in all of cinema in that movie in a, in a Native American villain named Magua, who is played by the actor Wes Studi. 
Um, and I, I had the chance to interview West Studio once about 10 years ago for something totally different. He was in a movie and I was talking to him. And I said, listen, man, I, that portrayal you did of Magua is just most, he, you know, he's the guy who he's just, uh, you know, I think he's a, it's one of those East coast um, tribes. I can't remember which one he's playing, but Algonquin or something, you know, and he's got this uh, revenge vendetta against this uh, British general and they're, you know, in the French American, French Indian wars. And, he finally vanquishes this guy. And when he does, while the general's still alive, he cuts his heart out and he picks it up. He takes a bite out of it and holds this guy's, you know, the heart of his enemy up. It's just really a grotesque, awful thing to do. And it makes you really dislike Magua. But I, I, um, <clears throat> I said to West Studio, man, how was that playing Magua, man? He's one of the most badass villains in cinematic history to me. And West Studio said, I didn't play him as a villain. I played him as a hero to his tribe, to his people. Oh, he was wow. a heroic figure. I never thought of him as a bad guy. Um, he was defending his homeland against these, you know, colonial invaders. And, and um, so he was doing what he had to do to protect his people and his land and his culture. So he goes, I went into Magua thinking he's the hero of this movie. And so it really it was a really cool answer from him. He's a really yeah. incredible person. But um, yeah, that's amazing. It really, to get back to your question about evil and status, it's kind of a matter of perspective, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, if we want to talk about evil in the way you did, and you're, let's say you're talking about a, a mass shooter, I don't know, there's probably no way to, you do, it is hard to wrap your head around why that would be good for that one organism to behave in that way. You know, yes. somebody who is going to, or a serial killer, right? I mean, I suppose they're satisfying some individual impulse. I don't know, man. I haven't really, I didn't really connect evil with status, but maybe I should have. Well, I'm almost thinking it's like an inoculation against self-destruction. That status, not entirely, but like it plays a role in that, that there's a, a certain defense that it um, offers to society. Let me, uh, I'm going to read from that. I got to turn this light on so it's going to blow this light out. This is from the oh, leaf of uh, dark nature. At a time when violence threatens to become epidemic and genocide takes the place of diplomacy in many regions of the world, it is no longer plausible to dismiss dark human behavior as simple human nature. What lurks at the foundation of life's evil? How can humans account for abominations such as the Holocaust, the war in Bosnia, or the daily terrors, theft, rape, and homicide? On and on and on. And so he's going to address all those things in dark nature. You need to pick, if you've been thinking about this, Ash, you need to pick up this book. It's a really amazing book. Oh, I'd, I'll get it like today. Yeah. Do you know why I haven't looked at this book in 25 years, but I know I knew I had this. I've got three copies of this book in my house because I was I was just <laughs> giving that to people all the time. This book made such an impact on me <laughs> when I first read it. <laughs> oh, I love finding a book like that is such a jam too. It's oh. I'm trying to get get I got this sunlight just beaming in on me, man. So I'm trying to find a spot yeah. that's not blowing out. Oh, good. You, no, you you're coming through good here on my end at least. Yeah. Um. So then I get getting into some of the mechanisms, what's changing now. Um, maybe there's some examples from the book that could be good at um, opening that discussion up. Um, one I liked quite a bit was the Paolo Scudieri chapter and, you know, starting this mega corporation from South Italy and the manner in which he got in, you know, and maybe talking a bit about that context and, and what he achieved. Yeah, one of the things I found, well, one of the things that was tough about this book uh, when I first started researching it was just how sprawling this topic is and how, I mean, there's a lot of books about stats, there's a lot of academic study of stats, there's a lot of commercial and industrial studies on stats. They have whole conferences about status every year all over the world for people who are trying to market and sell status and luxury to people, right? They want to know what it what it is about status that will appeal to people, how they can get people use the idea of status to sell products. Um, everybody looks at status. Governments, as I said, government of China, um, while I was writing this book, passed a law um, um, outlawing or prohibiting really um, ostentatious weddings of, of wealthy people, because as you said, it was sort of disabled, right? Like governments look at, at this. Risk. So, but in the course of looking at um, status, I, 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 a couple of trends or you know, commonalities started to emerge for me. And that was that the people who 
um, deliver status to us in, a, in particularly in a consumer way have a lot, have very similar backgrounds. They're not typically people who are from status backgrounds. Of course, there are always a few exceptions, but most of the people who you associate with status, high brand names, you know, Ralph Lauren and these kind of things, they're people who either started from very humble beginnings, even you know, poor beginnings or at least lower middle class. They're not wealthy people. They're not people whose upbringings were tied to status, but they seem to have been driven by this sort of social consciousness and by this idea of elevating not just themselves, but their entire social class or their communities um, through status somehow. Paolo Scudieri, who's the guy you mentioned, who is an Italian um, auto industry figure. Uh, his um, Adler Pesler is the name of his company, and Paul Scuderi is synonymous with luxury car interiors within the automobile industry, and now into the helicopter and private plane and private yacht industry. Um, his company is the one that will <clears throat> design and manufacture interiors of vehicles for Lamborghini or Rolls Royce or Bentley um, or you know whatever um, Ferrari is the the. The Italian car company through which he started his company really became prominent. Fiat actually is where he started, but he became a luxury car interior guy for Ferrari. And <clears throat> so he's known in, in uh, automotive circles as the king of comfort. When automobile manufacturers in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s started to um, contract out their the interiors and their seats and their <clears throat> interiors of their cars to third parties, that's when... Um, Scuderi kind of got into the business with Ferrari first, expanding to all the Italian car makers. Now they make car interiors for like 40, 40 or 50 companies. But Paolo Scuderi um, started life in Southern Italy in a little town just outside of Naples. And you know, Southern Italy, there, there's something interesting about it. if you travel to Italy that people find out, which is that the Southern part of Italy and the Northern part of Italy, the sort of tension between those two regions of that country has a lot of similarities between the North and South, historic North and South of the United States. Um, <clears throat> Southern Italy was typically the more impoverished um, part of that country. It was the lesser educated part of that country. It was the more religious part of that country. It was the more politically conservative part of Italy. And as a result, the same types of dynamics are similar, I should say, not exactly, because it's Italy, United States, it's not apples to apples, but there is this sense that, in the, that the North is this more prosperous, uh, more sophisticated, more intelligent, more progressive part of the country. And those types of feelings often lead people to look down upon those who have less money than them or less education who are less sophisticated. And so that same dynamic sort of exists in Italy. It still exists to this day. Um, the, every single Italian car manufacturer that you can name is located in the northern part of Italy. And so it, it was the northern part of Italy that has dominated um, automobile manufacturing in that country forever. Lamborghini, Ferrari being, you know, two pretty classic cases that way. Paolo Scudieri wanted to get into the automotive business. He was this poor kid, not really poor, sort of middle-class kid from this small town outside of Naples. He had some ideas. He was doing experiments with polyurethane. His, his father <clears throat> owned a furniture shop where they made um, chairs and whatnot out of polyurethane. And he had some ideas about using polyurethane in car interiors, which was starting to happen in the 1960s. And he took these um, ideas to various car manufacturers and set up meetings. And he was turned away at every, at every meeting, according to him, essentially because he was viewed as this kind of rustic, backwards, Southern Italian guy. What do you know about car manufacturer? What do you know about it? What do you know about luxury? Jesus, kid, you know, get back to the sticks. Thanks for, thanks for showing up. When he could even get a meeting. So he decided, he told me and he's told others that he, he, kind of made this vow to succeed, not just for himself, but to lift up the reputation, to elevate the status of all Southern Italians, or particularly from his area of Southern Italy. And he ended up <clears throat> wrangling this really interesting, interesting meeting with Enzo Ferrari, the, the founder and CEO, the guy who, you know, of Ferrari fame. And he got a meeting with Ferrari by sending him a, he sent him a birthday card. He didn't know Ferrari at all. He just did this kind of cold call thing. He said, you don't know me, I'm this guy in Southern Italy who have these great ideas for car interiors, but happy birthday, Mr. Ferrari, you're a, you're a legend and a hero of mine. And do you want me to tell this whole story about how this thing went down? Oh, it's a pretty cool story. Yeah, this is, it's one of my favorite chapters in the book. Yeah, it's one of mine too. Not just because I 
I went to Italy. I don't, well, whatever. I used my advance to go to Italy to, to, uh, to meet this guy and hang around Italy for a little bit. I, so I, I love that too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I blew. I had a couple of writer friends. They looked at this book and said, man, you must have blown your whole advance on traveling around for this like, which I did. <laughs> like most writers, you know, you lose money on all this stuff, right? You get paid so you yeah, spend yeah. it to do the research. Nevertheless, research in Italy was pretty cool. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so, so Scooter, I don't know, at this time, he's probably like this guy in his late 20s, maybe um, early 30s, and he's got this small polyurethane business going in southern Italy, and he's working in his father's furniture shop. And, and he, 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 he became an expert in materials, right? He went and got his education and was like a... He did, yeah. He became, oh yeah, I forget the degree, but it's some sort of, you know, materials engineering, you know, chemical engineer or something like that, um, a degree. He yes. went to Switzerland, yeah. a college in Switzerland to get that. Uh, but then he came back and his father wanted him to work in the furniture business and, you know, make armchairs or armrests, or which is fine. But, you know, this guy had sort of Paolo had these sort of greater ambitions. And he was also very fueled, he told me, very fueled by this desire to make it make Southern Italians, uh, not, 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 not these second class citizens that he felt they were being treated as, particularly in Italy in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Anyway, he writes this letter to, to Enzo Ferrari, the legend of all car makers, maybe in the world at that time, maybe Henry Ford and a couple others. But I mean, if you're talking car business, you know, Ferrari's the guy winning every race at Le Mans and all this. So he sends in this letter <clears throat> and doesn't hear back. Not surprisingly, you know, if you've ever written off to the CEO of a major company or, uh, you know, whatever, your, your favorite celebrity, you don't really expect to get something back. So several months go by. And he's just doing his thing. And he comes home one day and there's a letter in the mail from him, the post. And it's a little note from Enzo Ferrari himself. And it was postmarked about two or three months earlier. And it said, hey, I really appreciate your birthday card. Why don't you come up to uh, to uh, meet me? What's, what's the name of that town? Oh, yeah, I forget the name of the town that Ferrari's located. Anyway, come on up and meet me and we'll have a chat. And he says, here's the date and here's the time. It's, you know... April 2nd, 10 a.m., something like that. Be at my office. Well, uh, Paolo Scuderia receives this note on April 1st at about 4 p.m. <laughs> because the Italian Post, in all of its magnificent negligence, had failed to deliver. This, this note had been written to him in January or February or something, two months earlier. Wow. But it had taken a couple of months to get to him. But it literally arrives to his house on the day before the scheduled appointment. And, you know, back at this time, we're talking, you know, early 60s, people weren't emailing and they were barely really even calling each other for this sort of thing. You wouldn't call the president of Ferrari. It's like, hey, meet me here. I'll be here. <laughs> yeah. So Paolo Scudi goes into this panic and he goes to his parents. He borrows his parents' car. He says, hey, I've got this meeting at, you know, 600 miles away. Um, he goes, I got to drive up there overnight and get there and meet with Mr. Ferrari. Tell him about my great ideas for polyurethane. So gets in his dad's car, drives all night arrives at this town at something like four in the morning and he sees this little hotel, a little inn that's closed and he parks the car in the, in the parking lot and tries to get a little bit of rest before his meeting at about five 30 or six in the morning. There's a little tap on the window of his car and it's the owner of the inn saying, uh, who are you? Why are you, why are you in my parking lot sleeping in your car? <laughs> and he tells him this, he says, well, I've got this meeting with Mr. Ferrari up the road in four hours. And I just got his message and I didn't have anywhere to stay. So the hotel owner says, well, come on in. I'll give you some breakfast. You can take a shower here and, and clean up a little bit. The guy's really kind and he, he, you know, sort of a good Samaritan act. And so Scudier goes in, cleans up, rests at the hotel, goes and has his meeting. And he said the meeting only lasted 10 or 15 minutes because it was very straightforward. He says, well, why do you want to, you know, what, what is this, what is this great thing you've got? He says, well, I've got, I noticed that you've got a few problems in the interiors or with seals or something in your car. And uh, I think we can modernize Ferrari. And, and you know, at this point, Ferrari's slipping a little bit in sort of world prestige. Mm -hmm. And he says, I think with this new material, polyurethane can really change things around. And the guy says, well, can you deliver me, you know, whatever you're promising? He says, yeah, I sure can. Well, he couldn't. He didn't have any factory set up or supply chain. <laughs> yeah, okay. And Ferrari says, good. We got a deal. Shook his hand. Took 15 minutes. And um, wow. so Paul Scudieri goes back to to his hometown and immediately starts scrambling. He had some connections to a Fiat production plant down there. And he started getting a bunch of materials from this Fiat plant and the rest is history for him. He starts designing within a couple of years, he's designing the entire interiors of Ferrari vehicles and wow. he moves on to Lamborghini and, and 
you know, other, other car makers. And now, like I said, he, he, if, if there's a luxury vehicle out there, it's almost for certain that his company has, has had a hand in it, if not the 100% hand. In it. And now he's this yeah. fabulously wealthy guy. He still lives in that same hometown. He still lives in his small town in Italy. He's, you know, he's an artist and he races cars and he lives the, you know, the Vita Dolce or Dolce Vita or whatever, right? He's, he's got it all. He's a really nice guy. So anyway, I, I wrote to him. Wow. I shouldn't say he's a nice guy. I mean, and he might be. I mean, I met him once. Um, but I wrote to the company and I said, hey, I really love this story. Uh, how, you know, Paolo Scudieri kind of elevated this company, this Adler Penzler group. Wasn't uh, it really originally German? Yeah, it was a German company. Well, he started building stuff and then he, well, his father actually ended up buying a, a German company. Um, well, actually the Adler group was his father's company. He gave it a German name, Adler, I think means eagle in, in German, but it was actually an Italian company. Ah, yes. But then there was this big manufacturer and producer of auto parts and, and materials in Germany. And so he then did acquire that German company. Um, <clears throat> but it's all under his direction right there outside of Naples. And he told me yeah. several times during our interview, we walked around, we, I met him at this factory, this plant. You've ever seen that movie Ford versus Ferrari. They, they visit a Ferrari plant. And it's like this, almost like this old school building. It's very, you know, institutional. Yeah. Thing. And that's exactly what this building looked like where I met um, um, Paolo Scudieri and his you know, assistants. We sat in a room and talked for about an hour. And then he kind of toured me around the factory. And it was very interesting as he, as we we're, um, and we go to into this design room where there are all these people at the computers designing whatever they're designing, car interiors, helicopter, you know, sound, you know, dampening devices for yachts or whatever they were. And he would say like, these three people graduated from the University of Naples and these two guys over here are, are from even farther south in uh, Italy. And this woman over here is from like the deepest southern part of Italy. And he was really proud to show that maybe not all, but a, a lot of his workers and, and everything he was doing. And he, he repeated this over and over to me. And I don't think it was just total bullshit. I mean, you know, me with the head of CEOs of companies. Yes, they're going to gloss themselves and their reputations and their work. You know, you expect a little bit of that. And you, when you write about it, you try to take a little bit of that shine off. But um, he was so earnest and so so often repeating that um, his motivation had been to elevate the status of these people within the automotive industry to show that Southern Italians could uh, compete in this arena with Northern Italians. You know, could handle the wealth of that, could handle the engineering challenges, could handle the technical problems. Um, yeah, yeah. And in that way too. I it's also similar. I mean, look what's happened to the automotive industry in this country. It's all migrated to the South, right? That's because mm -hmm. it's not union, by the way. But um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the death of Detroit was no union uh, in, uh, you know, Tennessee and Alabama. Yeah, yeah. I So it's – and he, wait, he also has – like there was a restaurant that was mentioned in the book too. Is is He's opened a couple other things too in the region. And I was in – I was in – like I was in, well, so, so I went, <clears throat> I was escorted by this, pre, you know, when you go meet these guys, you know, you're not just walking around carte blanche. So there was a, a media escort for me that, you know, took me and we, we had our, our meeting with Paul Scudia and then we met, you know, the head of engineering and this and that. And they said, okay, we're going to take you to this lunch. You know, I was in the factory for about three hours. I got there at nine in the morning and maybe by 12, 30 or one, it was over. And I said, okay, well, you know, Mr. So-and-so is going to drive you back to your hotel, but he's going to take you to lunch first. And I said, okay, great. Thanks. So we go to lunch at this really nice restaurant and it's, it's got all this um, Southern Italian cuisine and cheeses and stuff. They make a big deal about it. it's regional to, you know, this part of the country. And then as I'm leaving, you know, I've, I find out there was a PR person from the restaurant came over and go, well, how'd you like Mr. Scudieri's restaurant? I said, what? <laughs> Figures, you know, that he would own the restaurant. Yeah. I mean, it didn't put two and two together. But that restaurant, all it was doing on the menu on all the marketing materials was just extolling the virtues of Southern Italian cuisine. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I had a, um, I have a story that maybe kind of makes the point of how divided Italy is to people. Oh, who yeah, don't really understand. Cause so I lived in Berlin for about a year and um, I had a girlfriend there and she was from Italy. She was from Trieste. Okay. And 
I went with her once home and visited her family and, and saw the region. And her dad gave me a piece of paper that had <clears throat> the dialect, like the, the Trieste dialect, some of the phrases. And like ordering a coffee in Trieste, if, if what they were telling me is how it actually works, if you want a black coffee, it's like ordering an N-word. Go to the coffee shop and say, I want an N-word. And they'll give you a black coffee whatever their word is for that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so Trieste is like the far North. It was part of the Austro-Hungarian empire. You know, right. it's like, and so that's their perception of the South. Like, I mean, it's as fierce as probably like 1800s America, North and South divide. Like, you know, it's still, it's so embedded in their culture that it's part of the language. Yeah. It's still like that too. I mean, I'm told yeah. by uh, others that it's, it's not quite, to the level of vitriol that was in the you know 20th century 50s 60s 70s 80s but that it's yeah. still omnipresent and very unflattering in that way hey can we quickly yeah. you know i tried to get the trash data several times so i had plans and it just never panned out i know you've done some travel writing as have i i mean is that is that a worthwhile place to go to i mean it looks like a really incredibly interesting port city with a really wild history yeah i really enjoyed it actually um Culturally, I like it's a little bit weird. It's and I, I had other friends from Italian from Italy and Berlin because a lot of people from Italy are going to Germany for work, you know. And people from other regions would tell me, like, oh yeah, Trieste is, you know, they'll they like they're it's a little bit um I, I'm guessing like uh I don't know what the word I'm looking for. It's just kind of aggressive. I don't know, they're very insular, but uh beautiful it's a, it's a really neat location I, I i went um i think we flew to v uh venice and then you just take a bus along the coast um but yeah that's it's beautiful and and where it's yeah. at i don't know the co the water's beautiful the town there's some really neat parts of the the town itself yeah i was just um, been intrigued by that town yeah this light is just driving me bananas anyway oh, sorry. <laughs> but yeah i was shocked i mean i i, I had I knew her for a long time. That was kind of towards the tail end of, of our things for us, but I had no well, idea. That would color your impression of the town anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when I went to um, saw Scuderi, I went, you know, he's right outside of Naples. I stayed in Naples and I'd heard a lot about Naples. Um, a lot of people like Naples, but a lot of people really trash it, you know, in the, in the travel scene it's dirty and it's crime ridden. It's dangerous. You shouldn't go there, man. I just loved it. I just freaking loved it all of Southern Italy. And it was, you know, it's only the second or third time I'd been in that part of the world. And, man, I just, I, I just thought, man, I could totally move here and live here. I thought it was a fantastic city. Yeah. 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 It's, I, I was there long ago. It's been ages. I think it was like 98 or 99 as part of our landscape. I, I was studying landscape architecture in school. And, and so, you know, the Italian gardens and villas and French, you know, yeah. all that stuff. So, so we went and on a summer trip, went there and, and we went to Naples as part of that. But I remember it being really beautiful too. Um, really good food too. Um, how about philanthropy? That was another in interesting chapter and in, in speaking about the, how <laughs> philanthropy kind of functions and both financially, but then also from the social status side of that. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, one of the things that's always, I don't know about you, but I never gave a shit about these shows like the lifestyles of the rich and famous or these yeah. news reports about here's the gazillion dollar yachts that um, rich people are buying now. I think there's yeah, a real so confusion about things that rich people buy and status. You know, it's like, it's bullshit. There, there, there's, it's just not really, I don't know. It's not, it's, it doesn't interest me at all. It doesn't seem to, affect most people either but i did want to talk because you know status is so conflated with wealth and so connected to wealth particularly in this country which is all about the almighty dollar i, I did interview a, a couple of you know super wealthy you know oh one percent of the one percent kind of people and one of the things that they told me <clears throat> about status within the wealthy community is that it's, it's not really about um you know, yachts and, 
you know, diamonds and possessions. A couple of guys said to me, one guy in particular said, you know what it's about? It's about buildings. It's about having your name on a building. That's what <laughs> is the real luxury marker for wealthy people. And that's why you see, you know, the, the uh, I'll make something up at the University of ABC Center for Cancer Research, you know, the, the John A. Smith Center for Cancer Research at University of such and such, right? He goes, that's really what sets, sets it apart for, for wealthy people. You can get your name on a big building. And the way you get your name on a big building is to give money to build that building. Just give it away. And typically what wealthy people do when they give away their money is give it to causes that they deem worthy or that are going to perpetuate their sort of class system and protect and build bulwarks around their um, the privilege and the status and the money and the wealth that they have acquired and will be able to pass down to their progeny or, or future generations. And that is why um, when super wealthy people give away money, they give it away to universities, typically elite universities, right? Ivy League yep. universities or mm -hmm. let's say Stanford's or the other type of university of the world to sort of ensure that that system remains strong and remains in place and has much more resources than other, um, you know, schools, universities. Um, they'll, they'll give, they'll bequeath land grants or <clears throat> parks or these and those kind of things. And this all sounds really good. And then they get a lot of good media coverage that, oh, so-and-so company or, um, you know, the Sacklers, the Sackler family gave a lot of money. You know, these are the guys <laughs> behind the, the opioid crisis. Yeah. They gave a lot of money to NYU and to Harvard and to, you know, university, whatever. I don't, I don't, I'm making those schools up, but they did give a lot of money to a lot of universities as a way to, you know, uh, wreathe themselves in sort of civic responsibilities while they're, you know, handing out op opioids to everyone in the country. But what they do in doing that, it's, it's really just an elaborate tax dodge. When, when, companies or nonprofit foundations or individuals give away millions and millions and millions of dollars, they're depriving that money from the US, US tax coffers, right? That, that, yeah. Those are write-offs they can make. Like if, I, if I decide to give $20 million to my favorite university, my favorite Ivy League university, I don't have to pay, that's deferred now, I don't have to pay that $20 million in taxes to the US government. And so it's a sort of a way of saying, I'm going to decide what the public, what, what that money should be used for. I'm not going to allow the politicians or the people to use that money to perhaps fund, um, you know, a Head Start program in an underprivileged city or, uh, you know, programs that might help end homelessness or solve the opioid uh, drug crisis or other than that, right? They shift um, that duty from politicians to themselves. They take that money away. And they write it off on their taxes. And so they end up paying almost no taxes. The other things that the very wealthy families do, well, they set up a foundation. And the tax laws suggest that the foundation only needs to, to donate like 5% of its income a year for it to keep its tax-free status. So they, what they do is they have an endowment of, let's say, $100 million. And they invest $95 million of that in the stock market. They give away $5 million of that a year. They write it off on their taxes. They write the whole $100 million off on their taxes. That 95 million that they've invested accrues, you know, whatever, let's say even at 8% or something, it, it makes another six and a half, seven million dollars that year, on and on and on and on. The endowment grows. They give away their paltry 5% each year. They write the whole shitload off on their taxes. And yeah. so when you, it, the entire philanthropic system, charitable system, is really an elaborate and not even that elaborate tax dodge for the wealthy. And this, you know, as soon as, almost as soon as, you know, the federal legislation went into effect that, you know, established the IRS and an income tax and, you know, business taxes, immediately there was outcry from industrialists and the real wealthy. And so very soon after that, you know, came these, these laws that allowed wealthy people, corporations to set up foundations or whatever to then divert their tax payments into the donations that they choose. One of the most famous ones that uh, a guy told me about was that that people do all over. He said, particularly got popular in the Northeast. There would be, um, you know, families that let's say had 200 acres of property, you know, their estate sitting on 200 acres. Well, they're paying 200 acres. They're paying property taxes on that 200 acres year after year. 
So what they would do instead is, so they would set up a foundation and set up a nature reserve. And they would say, well, we're going to take of our 200 acres, we're going to take 175 of that. And we're going to donate that to the public. It's going to be a nature preserve. We'll keep our 20, 25 acres for our house and our state, our horses or whatever. So now they make, now they donate, right? They make a nature preserve out of a big chunk of their land. It becomes a nonprofit enterprise. It's totally taken off the tax rolls. They, they protect it from people or other incursions because, you know, we've got a wildlife sanctuary here or something like that. They reap all sorts of media plaudits for, you know, giving away this land for this public good and to preserve wildlife habitat on and on. Really all they're doing is creating a tax-free barrier of their own land that their foundation um, uh, controls and monitors. And in that way, they have just, so it's fucking amazing, right? Yeah. So there's all these laws on the books that, that are, have, have developed over the years to really allow super wealthy people to, um, to, um, you know, evade taxes essentially. Yeah. So um, basically the public is funding a bulk of these donations more than they are almost like it's more than 50, 50. Yeah. percent there because they're, they're losing all that tax revenue. Right? Yeah. So now it's, it's now the public footing the bill for all these services that are absolutely required. And then, Oh, we don't have the money for them. We've got to cut back all this stuff. That, that, that's really, this is a really big part of this is at the heart of when you hear people talking about how the wealthy are not paying their fair share of taxes. We all sort of know about these offshore accounts and maybe wealthy companies hide their money in Swiss bank accounts or in the Cayman Islands or something like that. And, and that certainly happens, too. But but domestic philanthropy is probably the biggest you know, way that the wealthy skip out on their taxes. The other thing they do is if let's say I've got. You know, the Thompson, I want to start the Thompson family trust here of my grand, you know, <laughs> rate my bank account for my $30 million, let's say. So now I invest that and I, I need to um, hire someone to run my foundation, you know, president of my foundation, and I need various officers and all that. I can appoint my family members to those positions. So I can essentially pay my wife or my son or my first cousin or my best friend to this and we're going to pay you know it's a huge foundation and boy we dole out about two million bucks a year we need to probably pay someone about 250 grand a year to run this foundation to give away this money so i'm going to pay my wife 250,000 a year to, to do that and it's all it's all tax it's all non-profit it's all not right it's not taxable that's just it's absolutely wild and there's a there's several books on this whole scheme and i kind of talked to some of the people that are involved in it and wrote about that so yeah but and in the end, because because it's so important, the one one thing that really super wealthy people don't like at all in this world that they can unify all right Republicans, Democrats, whatever they hate paying taxes. They fucking hate it. <laughs> yeah. and they'll do anything they can not to pay it. Anything. And they've got but, this really elaborate series of tax laws on the books that, that allow them to do that. And and so because of that that system, rigging that system and working it, that's where this kind of thing about um getting your name on a building that shows that you've got some real money. That's not just donating 2 million bucks to a school to, to build a new library or to, to put books in a library. That's to build a library or, you know? Yeah. And so essentially this certain tier of society in order to achieve status, you basically have to rob the public. <laughs> you get a tax so break, you rob the public, and then you get no, no, you get fame among your peers for, Joining with yeah, them. among your peers and among the whole among the whole world, your names yeah, on that yeah. building, that yeah. opera house, or that orchid, that performing arts centers are real big. Are real. That's why you see all these performing arts centers are supported by the such and such foundation or by the such and such family, or you know. So, so how is all this changing now? Like, <clears> I, 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 let me. I have a couple. I, so, like, you know, the tech executives that are wearing hoodies and looking like the average Joe you know, blending in and, and working now is kind of changed to where now the most successful work more than before. Whereas before it was almost like a renter class that is like the leisure class. Um, I'm curious also the internet. I, I think the internet is a big, pretty big factor at play. I mean, I remember back in the eighties and nineties that, you know, it was like selling out because you had to go through the gatekeepers. Now you make it based on your work. So you kind of like, 
if people like your music, you're going to make it. If people like your writing, you're going to make it. If you know, it, it's more flattened in that way, just through the internet. Cause you're not having writing is maybe a little bit less cause you still have publishers, but um, I, I don't know. The music one is, is one for me where it's like a, a good frame of how much has changed, you know, because before there was selling out. So you, so the punk so rockers, selling out, it's really funny. Bring this up. I was talking with about this thing is selling out. We both know, right. In the eighties and nineties, that was kind of the ultimate sin of a musician was to sell out. Right. Yes. Of a serious musician. Cause, of a TV cause, rock you, had, artist, all, cause you had to get it. You had to get in with the label. You had right. to get recording time and you had to sell <laughs> albums. And so you're, selling out is basically like the accusation is that you stop being true to what you want to do. And you're just putting out a sound that, you know, will get you in the door. Are, you, are you saying to me, and I'm not arguing, I'm just asking, are you saying that that concept no longer really exists or it's not really an important. Yeah. It, it, it's almost right. gone. Kids don't even know about it now because you don't have to get permission from anybody. So yeah. you're never selling to somebody else. You're just doing your work. And if it hits, it hits. You know, some people have a hand in, you know, they, they know people or whatever, but at, ultimately you're not going through an agent to a company to put it out in the way that they know it will sell. And so well, there, is, yeah, there, you know, is YouTube, this, there is this concept that I hear people talking about of, of certain musicians or artists being industry plants, right? That they'll say, oh, yeah. she's, a, she's a plant or whatever. And there's this great suspicion around their artistry or whatever. Um, yeah. Uh, you know who was the biggest, well, not the biggest sellout, but the in, through the 80s, I mean, REM and the Replacements were kind of the two American bands of, of really that were huge in the alt rock scene. And there was a very stated ethic among those bands that you know we will not sell. We're not going to go to a major label. We are not going to, we're going to stay with our local indie label. We're going to stay small. We're going to stay true to our roots. We're not going to do this whole um, entertainment machinery thing. But of course, the money was so great that it, it had, you know, I think R.E.M. did five albums for IRS and they finally signed with Warner for a couple million bucks or whatever it was. It was a real big deal, real big deal at the time. Now they got away with it because yeah, they were yeah. so good and they remained credible. But you know what, you know the name of their first album when they signed with a major label? No. It was Green. <laughs> Seriously. Green. Yeah, that was their no Warner way. And the replacement <laughs> At least signed. they owned it. <laughs> yeah, at least they owned it. They did. And they, they managed to navigate that. And I think people forgave the replacements for signing the Sire. They put out a pretty good record, Tim. One as good as their indie stuff. Anyway, you're right. That was that was such a just a major discussion point in the music world and among fans. Like who was a sellout? Who was it? Yeah. But I remember hearing an interview sometime in the eighties or nineties with I don't know it was it was two of the bill might have been Paul McCartney, Mick Jagger, or Keith Richards in the same interview or something. But they both said, What the fuck? We always wanted to make money. That was always our motivation. We never hit that. Oh, you know, yeah, we're, yeah. The, we're from these poor, yeah. I forget what they call them, not tenement housing, public housing, whatever they call it here. Yeah. We're from these shitty housing rows that all we wanted was to make money. Get out. We made we never said anything different. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember hearing a just, money and cars and girls and guitars, right? That was the whole thing. Yeah. I think it was John Lennon that said it was either John Lennon or Paul McCartney. And they would said that they would sit down and be like, Hey, do you want to write a swimming pool? You know, like, <laughs> you know, like we can sit down and write whatever. And it'll be like, here, we can have a swimming pool in our, you know, it's like, that's hilarious. I've never heard that. Council. Yeah. Flats. I can't remember all those where I heard it. Council flats. Maybe. Yeah. 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 In London. Um, outside. They were in the I've never heard about writing a swimming pool. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. When I look at the world, I see like the politics is crazy. The new, you know, cable news is crazy. The, it just seems like all the, there's a huge transition overall that this is tied in with. That's, you know, this concept of status is involved in all these facets of society that are all, and it's all changing. It feels like there's a I massive so. shift kind of across the board. I, I, I think so. I think this is really a, a, not all of it, but it's a big part of it. Um, yeah. And I think there's a couple of things that are fueling it. One of the things I mentioned earlier was, um, you know, prior to essentially the turn of the 21st century, right before it, um, you know, we didn't have this technology called MRI, right? 
where we could fMRI, we, we could look into our brain. We look at our brain circuitry and see what was happening with it. See how the brain is processing various types of stimulus, stimuli, right? So if you drink, if if you drink a orange Fanta, and we could sort of see the what was happening in the brain, like what, how does that change brain chemistry, or if you know the way that we are responding to pain or whatever, right? We can we can look at that in real time. We can see what what happens in the brain. Well, there were a couple of people, particularly down at Caltech, um, started started looking at this idea of status and what happens to the brain while the brain is experiencing or perceiving to experience status, high status, low status, whatever. It was a really um, well-known experiment carried out at Caltech by a woman named Hilke Plasman, who um, did this great experiment where she, she took all these subjects and, you know, in, in the great tradition of uh, psychological experiments, sort of involved a ruse where she told people that the test was trying to measure something that it wasn't really testing. She said, hey, we've, we've got all these wines. We've got these expensive wines and cheap wines and mid-priced wines, and we want to test their how they digest or dissolve or some BS, you know, and so we're going to have you sip these wines and then we're going to monitor stuff in your body and see what happens. So she went out and bought a bunch of, um, or her assistants perhaps, <clears throat> bunch of wines at Trader Joe's and she you know, gave these sips. They did it. They injected them through these syringes. You know, people are laying in those, you know, MRI tubes and the scanners. Right. So they had these yeah. tubes. They would say to them, okay, we're going to give you this, um, this, this wine you're going to taste is, you know, $8. It's a off brand that we picked up at Trader Joe's Cabernet or whatever. Taste it. They watch what happens. And the brain kind of sits and fizzles and pops doesn't do too much. And they say, okay, this next one we're going to give you is like a $40 bottle of wine from this, you know, wine shop, you know, downtown or something. It's just French wine or something. And they give them the $40 bottle of wine and they would notice that a little bit of dopamine rushes would start to occur. You know, that, that, that's a sort of the main pleasure chemical that the brain releases when it's experiencing pleasure. And the, the sort of pleasure centers of the brain would start lighting up a little bit. Then they say, well, now we've got this kind of rare, you know, $200 bottle Chateau de something, there's only like 200 of these produced, you know, per year, 200 cases a year and blah, blah, it's really expensive. And they give these sample of that wine. Well, the brain, the dopamine levels would just flood through the brain on the $200 bottle of wine, just go bananas, just go bonkers, light up and people become really happy and get this really big emotional rush. And so this was showing that, you know, when people were, um, you know, experience what they perceived as status, a really expensive wine versus a low level wine, they would, they would, they would literally get high off it. Now what the interview subjects didn't know was that they were tasting the same wine every single time. The wine itself was, Seriously? it was the exact same bottle of Cabernet bought from Trader Joe's for like 12 bucks. But when people were told it was expensive, told it was a prestigious, a sort of status adjacent product, they, they experienced great pleasure. And so what this sort of did was, was and then there's various tests of various different types that kind of replicated these results, but this is the famous one, one of the first ones. What this really did was overturn centuries and centuries of belief about status, that it was this artificially created um, phenomenon that, that if, if I wanted a, an expensive wine, it was just because I had been duped by the advertisers or the, a clever marketing scheme. Or if I wanted an expensive car, it was because I was this vain, um, you know, self-involved person. But really what these show is that this status is as fundamental to our, our desires as, you know, it's, it's as food and sexual gratification and oxygen. It's a part of our brain chemistry. Human beings yeah. really, right? You're not getting, you're not enjoying the $200 bottle of wine more because it tastes better or because it's got some incredible heritage behind her, this or that, but that doesn't mean you're not enjoying it. You might be enjoying it for a different reason than you thought, but the, the, the brain wants status. It craves it. It's, it is to some degree like a drug. And so that's starting to change people's perception about status in general. It's like, let's stop shaming people for wanting this thing that the brain wants us to want, right? It's releasing. Yes dopamine so this is in the scientific world and in the world of um, high-end luxury and and any kind of marketers it's really changing the way that they're viewing status and that they're trying to um, appeal to people 
in their status. They're not, they're not, we shouldn't be shaming people for something that's as natural as, like I said, wanting to eat food or, or have sex or whatever else it might be. Now, on the other hand, when you talk about what's going on in society, I mean, there has been clearly these assaults on the pillars of privilege over the last five or 10 years, right? Yeah, particularly in the United States, but also in most Western countries and even non-Western countries all over the world. You'd have to be living under a rock not to not to have seen that. Um, and typically in this country, I mean, the, um, you know, privilege is associated with white males or at least white, you know, sometimes white females, um, which is for obvious reasons, right? Those are the, those are the, that's the demographic graphic group in this country that has essentially, you know, built and preserved and um, walled themselves off within a system of, of financial and social and other rewards. Well, that is changing. People are challenging that notion. And, and so they're, they're trying to define and they want to define status in different ways. Um, and that's part of this status revolution to me. A big thing that I, I feel like is that a lot of people are quite threatened by this. I think that's the wrong attitude to take. It's really obvious that when it's, there's sort of a all, all boats rise kind of thing with status. There's this idea that because, um, because you, Ash, might have a certain level of status, if I then want to attain some status, that means you have to lose some of your status for me to gain some, right? That it's kind of this zero sum game. There's only enough yeah. status, so much status to go around. And that when, when you have more than I do, for me to get some, you have to go like this, right? When Paolo Scudieri wanted to enter the Italian automotive world, right, to come up, there was this fear that, oh, well, if he's got status, I'm not going to have status. But that's not at all what happened, right? Paolo Scudier was able to gain status for himself and for his uh, southern Italian cohort, not to the detriment of those people in, in northern Italy, but sort of to their benefit. But I think that that's a real misperception among people, that if, if we are to be more sort of inclusive and if more people are able to attain status, that it's going to hurt those who are in positions of status right now. But it's my belief, and I think it's part of this status revolution, that um, that's not what's going to happen, that people should not be afraid of this revolution. They should not be afraid of looking at status differently. They should not be afraid of other people attaining more status than, than they might historically have had. This will not necessarily harm you or your group or your cohort's status. In fact, it I'm may raise everybody's. I love that so much. And I'm in so, such full agreement with that sentiment. I think a good example and of that and, and more, maybe just speaking more in terms of life, not being a zero sum game, not specifically status, although it's intertwined with it is what has happened with stand up comedy and podcasts. <clears throat> stand up. Me about it. I'm not, yeah. I want to hear this. So, so it's been, it put on it was put on warp speed with the um pandemic because they closed down all the comedy cubs and so the comedians who had podcasts managed it better you know because they had a separate stream of income but what happens is all the podcasts are independent people who have their own career they're you know like each person is let's say a business and they all go on each other's podcasts and they do what comedians do and they talk about the issues, but it's all funny. And comedy comedians are com constantly like day in and day out, just scouring culture for any bit. So they're like the forefront of speaking to cultural issues just because of the quest for co new material constant. Mm -hmm. and it's growing and growing. The, com the, com the world of comedy is getting bigger and bigger. And I think what happened is that the they put aside their own personal competition with each other and like, you know, worrying about who has the better uh, special or who has the better podcast, the more popular. And they just all started, you know, going on each other's and, and it elevated the whole world of yeah, comedy yeah, yeah. because they stopped back in the day in the eighties and nineties, comedians were at each other's throats. They didn't want other people to succeed. And it was yes. also through the gatekeepers. You had to go through like the late shows or you had to go through the clubs and sometimes you had to be clean versus anyhow podcasting, internet, um, stand up comedy. When you put them all together, it just completely elevated the whole form. And now, now com comedians are getting rich, all of them, 
once you get to a certain tier, they're, they're blowing it. I mean, they're making so much money just podcasting itself. If you get to a certain tier is hugely financial. And then there's clubs everywhere now, uh, comedy clubs all throughout the country. And so I think it's a good example of how that works. Like if you just let go of this idea that if I lift somebody else up, I'm going to go down too, or that, you know, I'm helping my competitors replace me. They ended up just elevating the whole form and then they all came up. It's kind and of the, it's, it's kind of the fast food example, right? It's why you see, Wendy's next to Burger King, next to McDonald's, next to KFC, next yes. to Taco Bell. A part of it's because it's zoned that way. But, um, you know, you would normally think if I own McDonald's, a McDonald's franchise, I don't want to be next to a Burger King franchise. I don't want to compete with yeah. that guy. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is it's not how it works. You want to be next to Burger King. Because when people yeah, think yeah. Burger, they're, they're, they're all going to come to that spot. Yeah. I mean, like in, in Asia, you, it's all the, you know, like you go to Vietnam and there's like stuffed animal street and every <clears> shop that sells stuffed animals is like right there. And really? you know to go to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in <laughs> no way I remember that. Or, or, you know, like light, you know, hardware street or, you know, yeah, and right. all the shops that had the same, you know, the same stuff, they congregated together and it's, yeah, it's that same, but no, I, th I thought that was a, that's a really great point. I think it's a really good uh, spot to close on that okay. this is for the better. It's not something to be afraid of. And um, I don't know, just pay attention. It was a really fascinating book and, and, and I really enjoyed reading it too. Well, so, enjoy talking to you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. On. Oh, sorry. You were wrapping up for me. I stepped over here. We never end up oh, talking good. about your line. Explain your line. We can do that another time. Maybe talk about, some, Oh, I'm, I'd be happy to. Yeah, actually that, I mean, that no, was how funny. I uh, you know, you want to wrap up. That's cool. <laughs> I would, I mean, I would be more than happy to have another time like to meet again and have another, have another recording and talk about some of your other work. I think that's a great idea. So cool, let's yeah. Do it. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll send you my stuff too. And, and I don't know. I'll oh, yeah, I want to read your Myanmar book. I'm anxious to read that. Okay, cool. Yeah. But the, I, I would love to have a conversation, another conversation. I'll, I'll reach out and maybe we can focus on some of your other stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm this one I was still. I was going to say, I was sitting in Bangkok once, this is about 20, 30 years ago, and um, ready to fly to Myanmar the following day, and we had our tickets, and it was just a group or something, and <clears throat> whatever, the government just like overnight said, no, we're not going to, no flights are coming in for the next two weeks, or, you know, no, we're not accepting any foreign visas for the next two weeks, for whatever, I can't even remember the arbitrary reason, there had been some unrest in the capital or something, and they said, fuck it, no, no tourists coming in right now. And so I was sitting there. I think I got a refund probably, but I was always really disappointed. I was literally, you know, 10 hours away from going to Myanmar and, and you know, we're ready to go to the airport and they're like, eh, sorry, I can't go. Oh God, that's a bummer. Yeah, a bummer. it really was a bummer. I, I, it was part of the reason I'd gone to, to Bangkok was to get to Myanmar actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm curious if, if I, it's dangerous for me to go back because I kind of went in under the radar and then I wrote this book about it all um, after the fact. And so I haven't been back yet. So I, I have no idea how they are about that stuff now. Um, you know, I, I did this book called to hell holes and back, which was essentially about going to places that, you know, I'd been advised against going for one reason or another. And a couple of them had been because it's dangerous. And, you know, I had this experience a long time. We went down to Mindanao in the Philippines, which is the most southernmost island in the Philippines. It's the Muslim island of the Philippines. It's been the, the island of, of unrest ever since, you know, the Spaniards rolled in there and the Americans and now the Philippine government. And everybody said, man, Mindanao is bad news, man. Don't go down there. You're going to get robbed, worse, kidnapped. And I went to this one village. I was going, there's, there's a mountain there, Mount Apo, that I ended up hiking. It's the largest, tallest mountain in the Philippines. And these people were really super nice to me, just really nice. I forget, you know, how I met them, but, you know, I was in this really small town getting around there, giving me drinks and food and helping me out. And here's where you need to go to go up this mountain and we can give you a guide. You need to ride up there when you need. And, and they said, and I said, wow, boy, I'd heard Mindanao is really kind of dangerous and I shouldn't come here. You guys have been incredible. You go, well, this is a nice town, but man, that town, you know, 10 miles up the road, don't go there. They're really bad news. They'll kidnap you. They'll steal your car. <laughs> don't not go up there. Inevitably, I go up to the next town. They're unbelievably nice. They're super cool. They're super helpful. But they say to me, well, we're pretty nice. But that town 10 miles down the road, don't you dare go in there. They'll fucking rape you and rip your stuff off. They'll kill you. Man, I don't know. I know people get in trouble. I wouldn't go into a war zone. That's a different story. I'm not saying every place on earth is safe. But 
I heard Mexico City was the most dangerous place in the world. Oh my God, Mexico City is incredible. It's one of the most coolest yeah. towns. People are so nice. You know, I heard this island in the Philippines was bad news. I went to the Congo, which was kind of rough, I got to admit. But people were really nice, you know. They did take a few bribes. Yeah. They were going up a few times here and there. But I never really felt my life was in danger. Anyway. It's a, so, all yeah. right, we'll talk about Myanmar later. I'll read your book. It's not, it's not as scary of a world as, as it gets portrayed as, isn't it? Generally no, it's speaking. not. Of course it's yeah. not. Yeah, you find that over and over. Yeah. So, anyway. All right, man. Well, listen, thanks for having me. It was fun talking to you. Yeah, thank you for joining us. I really enjoyed talking with you. Yeah.